Hey, Mike here. Uh, once again, Canadian Music Week is going on here at the Sheridan Hotel. Uh, really pleased to uh, once again be meeting. I think we last met a couple years ago at M for Montreal, I believe it was. And uh, But of course, this is Ian McKay, head of ReSound. And uh, well, Ian, uh, well, first of all, I know it's a really busy day and time of uh, time of the week for you, but just first of all, thanks a lot for joining me and making a, a few minutes. Pleasure. Yeah. Uh, when we met a couple years ago, um, the Copyright Board of Canada had just had relatively just released its uh, tariff eight decision that set a uh, unexpectedly low rate. I guess I could say a bit euphemistically, uh, un unexpected unexpectedly low rate for uh, streaming royalties. Uh, that I believe is for what is termed as non-interactive and semi-interactive uh, streaming services such as uh, CBC Music and Slack would be an example, but uh, uh, I guess before we get into the nitty gritty, would you be able to just kind of give us the Coles notes of uh, what that decision is and what it applies to and I guess broadly speaking, what, uh, how it compares to elsewhere? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's uh, so it is, as you described, it's a decision that, uh, that uh, covers streaming services that are non-interactive or semi-interactive, so not the fully interactive services where you can choose exactly what you want to listen to when you want to listen to it. But it would cover a service like Pandora, as it currently exists, if it launched in Canada. Uh, at the time, there were services like Songza, which has since closed because it was bought by Google. Um, but it covers services like that. The, 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 the issue in, in Canada is that unfortunately these things move at a snail's pace, whereas the business moves very, very rapidly in terms of different services starting up and, and, and business models changing. Uh, the process of setting rates moves extremely slowly. And as I think we talked about a couple of years ago, we had originally applied for a tariff to cover these streaming services in 2008, 2009. The hearing was in 2012. I think the decision was in 2014. We, because the decision did set rates that were about 10% or less than the rates existing in other countries around the world. So unfortunately, it's embarrassing. Uh, for Canada, we have the lowest rates in the world. Um, and there's lots of artists around the world talking about how rates are too low all around the world, well that's ten times as bad in Canada. Um, we, we have appealed that decision to the Federal Court of Appeal. We had that um, court date uh, just a couple of months ago now, um, so we're awaiting the decision uh, from the Federal Court of Appeal. Um, in the meanwhile, there's been a lot of um, uh, campaigning from artists, from labels, uh, the I Stand for Music campaign. Yeah, music Canada and SoCan have become involved. Yeah, yeah, Music Canada, the independents, uh, artists, you know, the bare naked ladies sort of speaking up and, you know, the If I Had a Million Dollars song yeah. sort of going through how many spins, how many plays they would need in order to buy that box of craft dinner or yeah. sort of whatever and it's, it's, it's crazy, yeah. Uh, when you took, uh, you say it was a few months ago that uh, you took the case the, to the appeals court. Yes. Uh, did you guys have to, or how did you have to alter your original argument for the appeals court, or did you have to? So, in uh, on an appeal, you're very limited in terms of y you cannot introduce any new evidence. All you can do is make the argument that, in this case, the copyright board aired in terms of making the wrong decision based on the evidence before them. But the, f the Federal Court of Appeal will not look at the evidence itself, it will just look at how the, how the board dealt with the evidence. So um, unfortunately, going back to the board decision, we had gone to the board with uh, market place agreements that, that, that we had entered into with streaming services. We also went with all the information as to what the international rates were around the world um, and the copyright board rejected both the marketplace rates and the international rates and set rates that they based on commercial radio which um, I think most people would say that's a very different 
sort of uh, a very different animal than than streaming services. Yeah. How? Because, uh, like we had said, this deals specifically the tariff rate right, uh, deals specifically with non-interactive and semi-interactive streaming services, which uh, I guess in practice are at least more sim like you were just saying. It's not a fair comparison, but at least uh, as well far as what they're doing for the consumer, it's more similar to radio than something like the premium service of Spotify or premium service of Google Play Music or Apple Music, where it is fully uh, on demand. How does the rates for those differ, and are they also set by the copyright board, or are they negotiated between the services and the labels and publishers? For the so for the fully interactive streaming services, those are negotiated between the labels and the uh, a, a, and the publishers on that side, but the labels and the services. So for that, it's not. So we we cover neighboring rights, performance rights, um, but when it moves into where you where something is fully interactive that engages the reproduction right or the making available right. So that's an exclusive right um, that the labels have and so they would license those services directly. So, so a Spotify would be licensed directly by the labels. Uh, is there two different rates, <coughs> excuse me, uh, if you're on uh, one of those major premium uh, subscription services, Google, uh, Spotify, and Apple Music. Is there a different rate between the on-demand uh, service and the curated playlist service? Or do their curated playlist services, uh, I guess the royalties generated from songs being used on the curated playlist, is that the same rate set as the on-demand portion? No, it would vary. So depending, uh, as more and more services offer kind of a suite of services that range from the non-interactive to the semi-interactive to the fully interactive, the non or semi-interactive would be covered by our tariff 8, but the fully interactive would be covered by the direct deals that the, the labels would do. Yeah. Uh, there's also a lot of talk here at CMW about YouTube, and it seems to be the uh, uh, taking the most heat, at least at the moment, as far as simply just not playing fairly, playing by a different set of rules as the other streaming services. Um, but Google Play Music has also recently kind of folded in YouTube early, because obviously Google owns YouTube. Uh, it's now, there's more meshing. I guess you could put it between its stream music streaming service and YouTube. If you're within Google Play Music, you can watch the videos of the bands you're listening to. So if you're doing that, and this is a bit, uh, I guess, a bit apart from what we were just talking about, but more out of curiosity, if you're watching a YouTube video within Google Play Music, which royalty is being paid? So un uh, unfortunately, no royalty under our regime to the performers and sound recording owners because our Copyright Act does not recognize audiovisual rights for sound recordings. So when a sound recording is embedded in an audiovisual recording, uh, there are no royalties payable for that. There are to songwriters, but there aren't to performers and, and record companies. So that's th that's something that we where we, we argue, and we argue before government puts Canada out of whack with, with other countries, um, and it's taking a lot of royalties out of the system um, that has increasingly the division between what strictly audio and what goes into some form of audio visual people are consuming however they want to consume to say that you should get a royalty if it's strictly audio but if it's coupled with a visual image no you don't get a royalty seems seems a little strange yeah yeah. Uh, in the panel you were just on, you mentioned that the Copyright Act is coming up for its annual, or uh, pentannual, however you term it, every five year, re five year, re yeah, five year review is coming up for the Copyright Act. Um, the federal government has also just announced that it will be doing, for the first time since 91, just a very widespread, full, di full scale uh, review of all broadcasting regulations and, uh, and policies, including the CBC's Mandate 8, uh, the CanCon regulations and all that. But, uh, but specifically, what you would said in the panel is you're going to be extensively lobbying for, uh, to get rid of um, uh, a certain subsidy for the yeah. broadcasters. Uh, could you explain what that is, what that subsidy is you're referring to and why uh, you and the other music organizations want to get rid of it? Yeah, so, so that's what we call the 1.25 million subsidy. That was when neighboring rights were introduced in Canada in 1997. Uh, there was a break put in, it, it's under the heading special and transitional provisions, but it's still there, um, a break put in that 
each radio station does not have to pay royalties to performers and record companies. They do pay full royalties to songwriters, but not to um, performers and record companies on their first 1.25 million of revenues. So every radio station in Canada gets basically a free ride on their first 1.25 million in revenues. That's costing uh, performers and uh, record companies about $8 million in lost royalties a year. So we're, we're saying, you know what, that's moving wealth from the, the, the creators, the people who should be getting it, to uh, the broadcasters who are extremely profitable businesses. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's not like, and we were just talking about this at the, at the last panel, it's not like this is, this is going to really affect their profitability, but it makes a huge difference to the creators in terms of whether they can make a living. Um, so, uh, and in the interim, from 1997 when it was introduced to 20 years later now, uh, the commercial radio industry has become increasingly concentrated with, within a few groups and much more profitable. So uh, we're certainly going to government and saying this is a subsidy that should not exist. You're subsidizing the, the wrong people here and you're taking the money and you're doing a wealth shift from the people who should be getting paid for their work and putting it into these companies. So it's, it's, so it's, it's time for it to go. And, and in terms of the overall review that's been announced uh, by Minister Jolie, um, yeah, it's very, it, it's, it's very exciting. It's, I, I think it's a long time since the federal government has said, you know, everything's on the table. And I think the aim of moving, moving things from a, um, uh, an analog world to a digital world um, c can be very exciting. I mean, I think we look at what I was talking about earlier, how long things take to go through the copyright board, and that worked in the analog world. It didn't matter that things took three to five years because business models weren't changing very fast. But now that things are changing so fast, and it is a digital world, we need processes that respond to that, and we need to be able to move faster, move more nimbly, sort of have more flexibility. Would you like to say, like, I've generally noticed uh, at CMW here during all the panel discussions that are going on, because so many of them, um, either by design or just because that's where the conversation goes, it's becoming almost a referendum on streaming uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. And and there's a lot of pros to streaming, absolutely. Uh, you can kind of see that on a macro level through the IFPI's report last year that yeah. for the uh, first time in I forget how many years, there was actually growth as far as revenue in the uh, recorded music business. But like we've been talking about, there's an awful lot that's not working and still needs to be worked out. Um, I guess where I'm going with that is like when it comes to something like uh, this large-scale review you're just talking about that Minister Jolie announced, is it time to kind of just put everything on the table and come up with, because it seems like everything's being worked out bit by bit and very piecemeal and we're trying to cram new realities into an old system, uh, is what really needs to happen is just... <sighs> I almost don't want to say start from scratch, but that's kind of is. We just need one whole inclusive, logical way of working this instead of trying to work it out piecemeal to just make the streaming reality uh, just work for everybody. I mean, I think, I think absolutely there's, there's lots of positives to the huge growth in streaming. And I, at the panel, the State of the Music Industry panel yesterday, the sort of heads of the music industry organizations from around the world described it well that streaming's taking off, it means that in most markets there's been a little bit of an uptick in the last year. So that's all very positive. But when you turn around and see that uh, subscription consumption has grown by, and it depends on each country, but by 50%, but the money that's getting back to the creators has only grown by, you know, less than half of that. That's what the problem is. And I think, as, as they described it, the, the value gap that's growing there between uh, how much music is being consumed and how much the people who create the music are, are, are being paid for it. Um, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed through some legislative reform um, that then enables people to sort of rebalance uh, things in terms of the business models and, 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 and get on with it. Yeah. Do you think that the trend will be that these freemium, so-called freemium versions of streaming services will slowly be phased out? You saw it with Apple that started off 
aside from the free trial, there is no free version of Apple. Uh, there's no free version of Tidal. Um, when it comes to Google Play Music and Spotify, which the predominant number or the vast majority of their users are just using the free version. Um, but like you said, there's a huge value gap there between the paid for and the ad supported versions where, you know, I, I forget the exact numbers, but it's very disproportionate as far as the majority of the revenues generated from the minority of users who are paying for subscriptions. Uh, do you think that the trend for streaming services will be to slowly phase out the free versions and go solely paid for? I don't know. I mean, I think I think that's anybody's guess. Um, I think there's been a lot of surprising things for people in the last few years in that people thought that traditional radio was going to sort of slowly die out. In fact, it hasn't. When you look at uh, what people are listening to in cars, uh, they're listening to proportionately just as much commercial radio as they ever did. They're listening to less CDs in their cars and they're listening to more satellite radio and streaming services, but they're not listening to less traditional radio. So in terms of the, the uh, there seems to still be a big appetite among some consumers for a totally lean back service that, uh, that they can just have people serve up music to them. But then there's the other options for people who want more interactivity or just want to listen to exactly what they want to listen to. I think it depends upon how much of a music fan you are, how you listen to music. I think there's always going to be you know, a, a broad spectrum of offerings. And I think in the future, there's probably, it's probably going to get even broader uh, in terms of the different ways that you can consume music. Interesting. And uh, uh, I guess lastly here, before we wrap up, um, you maybe don't want to give any predictions, but do you have a sense of how you think the appeals will go on the tariff eight decision? And are you hopeful that uh, the appeals board will come back in your favor? So I'm not going to make any predictions on that at all. When things are before the courts, you, yeah, just, you, just, you just leave them before the courts. Um, for, for us, regardless of what the outcome is, it was extremely important to, uh, to, to launch the appeal and continue the fight for it. Um, uh, if, the, if the outcome is positive, then, the, the, then we'll move forward on that basis. If the outcome is not pos positive, then we have to look at sort of what we need to do in terms of talking to government about that. Uh, is there, do you know of a timeline as far as when you would expect a decision? Generally, the federal court takes three to six months for a decision, so or even four to six months. So I think we're two months in now, so we would expect a decision in the summer okay. sometime. Yeah. Well, again, this has been a very fascinating conversation with Ian McKay of ReSound. Um, good luck with the appeals decision. Uh, um, obviously, absolutely hope it comes down in your guys' favor. It would just be right for the whole music industry and creators. And uh, Ian, like I said, I know it's a busy week. I really appreciate you making the time. Eh? Pleasure. Cheers. Thanks.